Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Triangle Button Podcast. We haven't done it in a while. Uh, with me is Caleb, my wonderful friend. How you doing, man? Oh, I'm doing pretty well. How about you? That's good. Now I'm doing well. Well, there's been like a lot of like crazy like things in the news lately. Um, at first, like, well, this was a popular conversation that we've been talking about quite a bit, and that is uh, aliens, like that was going on with the government conference where they kind of established that not only are there like UFOs, which we've already known, like they released like documents and photos like in the previous year during COVID. However, they have also stated that there was non-human bodies that they found at these like crash sites and was just like curious of like your opinion on it and like about aliens, like in, you know, in general and what you, what's your opinion on the like existence and all of the crazy stories that have come their way. I don't know how to phrase that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think anyone knows how to phrase it. Um, it's, it's some pretty crazy stuff coming out. My intuitive position is that I do believe in the sightings of UFOs by the Navy that have been spotted since 2004. Um, and that these, what they're calling the Tic Tac UFOs, uh, seem to defy all of our conventional understandings of aerodynamics in modern fighter jets. Um, so whatever these aircraft are, they seem like they're able to move on a dime. They can go up, down, and, you know, east, west, north, south, um, without really any respects to inertia. And the, yeah, the radar and the naval systems don't seem to be able to get a lock on it. So whatever it is, it's leagues ahead of top of the line military technology or what we thought was top of the line military technology. I, as far as the description of non-human biologics goes, I suspect that's like a, a red herring. Uh, I think that there's, there's a variety of reasons for that. The main one just being that I think extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and the videos I've seen that are reportedly leaked from NASA of aliens uh, as they're as they're described i think are really dubious at best um and i the other part of it is that non-human biologics refers to anything that isn't a human being right like the the salamander that lives in you know in your porch is non-human biologics right the mosquito that you know bites you is non-human biologics plants are non-human biologics so that term, I think, is intentionally vague to some degree. So I, I would say I'm more open to learning about the probes, but less uh, less open to any uh, descriptions of interacting with alien life forms. Okay. Well, I think that's pretty interesting. I, uh, In terms of the aircrafts, I do agree like somewhat with what you were stating because I know that back during the, well, like the Cold War like era, I would say. The Area 51 was developing a lot of spacecrafts in order to like spy, like you know, essentially like spy like on the Russians, like during the war. So they were trying to find like these like certain aircrafts that not not only could travel very fast, but could also reach like super like high altitudes or sometimes like very like low to like essentially like eliminate any of the uh what's it called airwaves detection that they had over there so right. i know that like that was happening a lot and a lot of people that were like you know outside of area 51 were reporting a lot of weird spacecrafts and sounds and visuals so i totally get like the spacecraft thing however i do think that it's interesting that when they did say like non-human like i know you made the argument that well if they're saying like non-human that could be anything However, wouldn't it be also logical that if they're referring to non-human, they're probably like, they could have said animal if there was an animal, right? So that means that it has to be some form of creature that is not a part of humans, nor is a part of like any of like the ecosystem that we know of, what, no, which I think like provides a little bit more like, no? Because No, I think they were just in some way... Um... Yeah, I think they were intentionally leading on that where cuz like yeah, non-human biologics at face value just means not human anything that isn't human. And given 
what I understand about the way that legal <laughs> like court proceedings work and these hearings work, I think that he was intentionally just mm-hmm. giving an answer that was um, just vague, I suppose, um, as to what they were working on. Yeah. Uh, now, that also leaves a lot of room for there's a lot of interesting and, and ethically questionable things they could be doing with genetic experiments um in these sites right there there could also be a lot to do with bioweapons there's i I just think that there's a lot of room for non-human life forms that don't like like he didn't say extraterrestrial he said non-human biologics and i don't think we should jump to extraterrestrial unless they they make that jump okay but why would he even like offer like why is this conference even being held in the first place though why are they being so transparent about all of these you know like ufos and like creatures that they apparently like you know came into contact with like why would they even be this transparent we know that the government for you know throughout time have been quite secretive with a lot of like these like documents and sightings and everything and have shut it down like one of the popular things that they used to say was Oh, like that was just like, uh, like for example, like the weather balloon. Oh, it was a weather balloon you saw, or it was like a piece of metal coming off of an aircraft or something. You know what I mean? Like there was a lot of arguments to try to in order to dissuade people from that. Why is it that in this day and age, they are trying to like be so transparent about the potential, like the potential for like, you know, extraterrestrial creatures? Why would they even need to be this transparent is what I'm getting at. Mm, uh, I think there's two strong hypotheses there. Um, the first one is that, and this is the one that I think everyone has said to some extent, and I think a lot of people believe, is that it's a decoy. We're living in an era where America is slowly creeping towards, you know, a new nuclear arms race with the Russian Federation in an era where we're seeing like economic instability and uh, money printing on like anything we've ever seen in the history of uh, North American, like, you know, Western banking policy um, as well as just general like cultural divides. Like there's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes and there is a good chance that this is kind of a smoke show that they knew would distract people from the maybe larger, perhaps more substantive issues the other theory that is mm-hmm. also true, uh, or, or also has a lot of merit to it, is the fact that the United States military, for the better part of two decades now, has been finding more and more of these anomalies, right, of these unidentified aerial phenomenon, as they're calling them, which the public is starting to ask questions about and it's becoming harder and harder to hide and harder and harder to dismiss. Um, Mm -hmm. Like it isn't a small deal. The fact that whoever controls these objects has made the entire United States air force obsolete, which mind you in modern warfare, air superiority is the key essential feature of who wins a war. Like we've seen time and time again in Iraq and with the Six Days War and to a certain extent in World War II even, that if you control the skies, you control the battlefield. And if it turns out that America's 19 aircraft carriers and, you know, uh, triple digit numbers of like fighter jets aren't even aren't even a joke on, you know, the world stage when it comes to these rival these rival aircraft. That's something that really matters. It's something that um, uh, is actually really relevant to United States national security and the arms race. Um, And trying to figure out who controls these is whether or not it's extraterrestrials or military contractors or, uh, you know, a geopolitical rival of the United States like China. um, It is worth getting Mm -hmm. to the bottom two of what are these and how are they evading all of the radar in American air defense? So essentially like your, your two reasons are like, so it's the red herring. So they're trying to distract the public from like actual issues such as like the economy or whatever, like conflicts that are actually like um, prevalent within like the country. And then the second one you're stating that it's essentially they're trying to create more of like a moral panic 
and that like, oh, there's like something. So therefore would like, they should invest more of our tax money into going into the development of the military, like programming and like the development of aircrafts. Is that essentially where you're getting at there? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that pretty much summarizes it. Okay. I mean, yeah, like that does like make sense. Cause I mean, the military has always like tried to like incite moral panic, like whenever they needed to like get more military funding. Um, like, well, like look at like all of like the major wars we had, like even like your terrorists, like groups that they try to be like, oh, it's a terrorist on the loose. Like we got to like get like more money, like for like to fund like these programs in order to like send more people over. And it's like, ugh. okay. Yeah. So, but you, so that, that I get the second part, I guess like the one that's kind of like on my mind is like, what are they trying to distract from then in the economy? Like, or like maybe it's not the economy. Maybe it's like, again, like that issue, like within the country that's becoming more prevalent, they're trying to avoid responsibility of that. What would you say could be, or, you know, is like the issue that they're trying to hide? Let's see large. I mean, this is going to be politically biased to whoever is speaking of what they think the largest issues are, but if I had to take a guess, it would have to do with the facts that uh, a lot of large shifts in global power have happened in recent months between America and its two largest rivals, right? Like you have to you have to see that we we live in an era where Putin is threatening nuclear war with the West, you know, almost regularly. Um, as, as well as the facts that uh, they're sending, you know, billions of dollars of aid to Ukraine um, perpetually. And it's it's looking on some fronts like it could get worse or that it could get better, um, depending on sort of, you know, how how you look at the situation, and perhaps who you're rooting for. Um, yeah, with NATO expanding, as, you, as I'm sure you heard into Finland, that could be a large spike in this war. Um, and, and also on the Eastern front, the facts that are rather on the, the Western front, I should say the facts that, yeah, like China's sending spy balloons over and there's already rising conflicts boiling out over Taiwan and the possibility of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan and whether or not America would get involved in that. Um, and as far as economics go, I mean, America is just, it's in its era of highest inflation since I believe the 1970s. Um, was last time this stagflation has been this rampant before. Uh, but I, I'll have to be fact checked on that. I, I, I'm not for certain. Um, and yeah, it just looks like, or even the facts that you know it came out that, um, yeah, there's been government scandals with their involvement with social media and possible censorship. So it could be, um, and I'm sure there's also you know seven other reasons that I've left out that I'm uh of what the government might be trying to distract from because whatever they're trying to distract from, they've clearly done a good job. Um, but I would say, yeah, I'd say there's a good chance that it was just a way to, to sort of waste the public's time with this discussion, specifically in the way they talk about non-human biologics. I see that as more far-fetched or maybe that part is being false mm. um, simply because a, they used a really open a term, and B, I think they know that they're leading on the public into believing in like a kind of <laughs> a kind of alien that's very unlikely to exist <laughs> in my mind. Um, which I guess sort of brings up. I guess I'll ask, um, mm -hmm. what what are your thoughts on the existence of aliens? Um, do they exist? Do they exist in our solar system? Do they exist as intelligent beings? Do they exist as physical beings? Um, what, yeah, what are your thoughts on the, the question of aliens just broadly? Well, I would say that I, well, for starters, I do think aliens like are real. Like it's, it's really hard to imagine that through our entire solar system and galaxy that we're the only like living, you know, intelligent life form that exists. I think that's quite, um, you know, narcissistic of like humans to be like that. And I, <laughs> yes, it would be. I do believe that like, it's kind of like, honestly, like humans are always like, yeah, of course we're the only ones. And I'm like, yeah, you guys always think you're the best at everything. But in reality, there's a lot of creatures that are more powerful, stronger, or somewhat intelligent. Like look at fucking dolphins, man. They're more intelligent or they're getting up to that intelligence in like a different yeah. like form. Right. 
And like, I, I do think that, you know, there has to be something, you know, if we exist, there has to be something similar that exists in the, like now in terms of whether it's in our solar system or not, that is definitely a, an interesting question. I know you brought up the idea that in order to create technology, which that can leave our solar system and travel into another one or outside of the galaxy has to be very superior because of the energy source that's required in order to do that. So that's why I, you know, in our last discussion, I mentioned, well, what if these aliens or creatures, what have you, they just already exist in our solar system. So the the spacecraft, it's like they can they can be like they probably would be more intelligent than us if they exist like outside because they would be like travel if they're able to travel to our planet that shows they have more advanced spacecrafts than humans do. And yes. even in like some of the examples you mentioned, like the Tic Tac example where it's literally defying inertia, like gravity. It's like, bruh, like that's that's kind of crazy to conceptualize, right? So. Clearly, they have to be intelligent to create that technology. I know that through various films, they've brought up the potential of, well, what if these spacecrafts are the aliens themselves? And like, such as the movie Nope, you really need to watch that film. Sorry, spoil. It's not really a spoiler alert. It's kind of obvious because you see a part of the creature um, and where the spacecraft, it's like cylindrical. It's like a disc that's gray, but it's the actual flesh and it's a living, it's a living being that sucks up like, you know, various objects and life forms in order to consume. Right now, I don't know if like if that's going to be exactly what an alien is. I think that they do exist. It's not hard to say that they exist in our own solar system, and that's why if they don't have to have the most advanced tech, but maybe just slightly more than what we have to travel faster towards our like planet. Um, I don't know. Does that give like a good answer to what you're looking for? Um, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, if you don't mind, there's a few sort of little uh, asides. Maybe I'll try to tack on to what you said. Um, because largely I think you're, um, I, I think I agree with everything you said. I think the, I had always thought there were sort of two interpretations of aliens or not interpretations, but rather theories of how aliens could exist. Um, but I, as it turns out, there's actually three. Um, so the, the first one is the question of interstellar travel. I'm working backwards here, but we'll start with far away. Um, the nearest star. Yeah, sure, man. Uh, yeah, the, the nearest star is Alpha Centauri. It's a trinary star system with, with three stars all orbiting each other. Um, and mm -hmm. Without getting too lost in the weeds of habitable planets there, the real limitation is the fact that it's 4.5 light years away. And 4.5 mm -hmm. light years is such an, it sounds like a small number, but it's such an incredible distance given the speed of light that if you were to use the fastest spacecraft we've ever built right now, it would take hundreds of thousands of years to get bridge that distance. Um, now that being yeah. said, um, I don't dismiss the idea of interstellar travel because there are a few worth considering that I think people should look into if they're interested, uh, machines that have been sort of hypothesized of what could solve this problem, just as humans looking to go to other stars. Um, one of them is project Orion, which is. Well, to put it quite simply, it's a nuclear powered, it's a nuclear <laughs> explosion powered spaceship, which uses the mm -hmm. force nuclear blasts to yield basically like a mop. Yeah. Thrust forward in space. Um, and estimates vary. Wait, on pause, pause, pause. Are, are you suggesting they basically set off atomic bombs to propel yes. themselves? Um, yes. And they have a large, like, that's fucking incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. It's also kind of absurd. Um, but it is right now. <laughs> right Yo, now. If, if, that, if that's how aliens travel, that's fucking amazing. Well, it, <laughs> just it, imagine it like, like Oppenheimer would be like, I used like, I am the, like, oh, what's it called? I am the bringer of death or so. And then these aliens be like, Yo, I just launched these as by fuel, my man. <laughs> I yeah, got yeah. 20 more in the chamber. 
not the destroyer of worlds, the um, uh, finder of worlds. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, but, yo, rebranding. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, well, do, do keep in mind, like, uh, a nuclear blast um, has, like, the, the last nuclear blast, like, the largest nuclear weapon ever tested was the Tsar Bomba. And they let it off in, like, the northern islands of Russia, and it broke windows in Finland. Um, like, you see, the effects of them can be felt all over the planet. That's just how hard they, they hit. These things of, yeah, these things have such incredible power. And we haven't even hit the limit of how, like, we don't know how large nuclear weapons can get, is the the terrifying thing about them. That we only stopped building them larger because we yeah. knew that if we built a bigger one, we would cause a fallout um and you know and end up having environmental effects that we wouldn't be able to adjust for but so the theory of project orion is well, yeah that um nuclear basically yeah nuclear detonation whether it be fission or fusion can uh can propel a spacecraft forward with the speeds necessary to bridge this sort of gap um which mm-hmm. yeah it, i think as you said is pretty incredible um the the other yeah the well other, well and, oh, sorry. oh sorry you go i was gonna move on to the next oh no there you go you go um, yeah 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 of course um the other sort of going theories of how this gap could be bridged um one of them is a solar mm-hmm. sail which is as it sounds it's it, there's a few different variations of it but if you build a large enough sail the idea is that you can use the background radiation of stars to on a large enough surface to actually push a ship forward, which I've heard estimates could get you towards something like forty percent the speed of light, um, if used wisely. What? So a giant sail using the radiation from stars propels people forward. That's the theory. Or like pulls, I guess. Not propel. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. It, that's the concept. Um, yeah, the radiation. World's been watching too much Treasure Planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the, it is a real concept um, that's been that's, that... that it's been demonstrated to be uh, like effective. Like the of all the different theories here, this one seems to be the it's the soundest, but also the weakest. Um, meaning that like a solar mm-hmm. sail, um, even with the estimates of forty percent, that it seems like that's a pretty hilariously large <laughs> construction to do that. Um, so as, as for the mm-hmm. time being, it doesn't look like solar sails. Um, it looks like they have the highest chance of succeeding, but also their success might not be as, you know, as impressive as other methods. So, um, but even like solar power is how we power them, uh, like the Voyager probe right now. Like it is just the, the means which we power our, like the, the international space station has large solar powers and that's solar panels, which is how it powers itself. So solar power as sort of the method of propulsion is, um, uh, it's not too far fetched. Yeah, man, that's just crazy like, to think about. Because, like, well, I, actually, just a quick question, just going back to the yeah. atomic bomb being released and essentially propelling you. Um, ha- Have we, like, launched nuclear bombs in space before? Um, I don't believe so. In fact, I actually know we haven't um, because of the International Treaty just... on wep- on Weapons of Mass Destruction in Space. Um, but essentially it's, it's forbidden by international treaty and law that any country use what's defined as a WMD, a weapon of mass destruction outside the earth's atmosphere. Uh, and this includes anything nuclear, biological, chemical. No, it has. Oh, okay. Um, it says, right. Well, sorry. I just Googled cause I was really curious. It says, the U.S. military thought it had cleared the decks when, on the 9th of July, 1962, it heaved a 1.4 megaton nuclear bomb some 400 kilometers into space. Orbiting satellites were safely out of range of the blast. Oh wow! Um, well, then I stand corrected. Yeah, they've they've launched weapons into space, um, which yeah, I'm kind I mean, of. Can- I- Oh, sorry. Yeah. How would that work, though? Does the re- th- okay, this might sound like dumb because I'm not exactly like you know, 
uh, know like how nuclear bombs exactly like work because they don't require any like it's not like any oxygen, right? Is like used within the blast. I know that sounds dumb, but it's like when it, it explodes, right? Like I think of like yeah. a f- like fire, an explosion, like oxygen it's would use it to propel. Fire. So no, okay. Um, like okay. When, when one one example that sort of I have to clear it up because it's such a common misconception. Mm-hmm. Um, the sun isn't a big fireball. It's not like just a big campfire in space. There's no oxygen to fuel a campfire in space. The sun is a new. Oh, planet. I I know I know that one. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm not saying. I'm just saying generally. Like a lot yeah. of people will describe the sun as if it's just on fire all the time. Um, which I, there might be fire mm-hmm. in it. But the primary core of it is that it's a it's a nuclear reactor. Um, but mm-hmm. but yeah, no, yeah. Uh, nuclear reactions do not require oxygen. Um. Isn't isn't the sun like a ball like a ball of gas? Yeah, it's a ball of gas that's effectively uh causing nuclear fusion in the core because of how large it is. Mm-hmm. That's that's yeah, that's why it's hot. Okay. Um yeah. But but yeah, the, the this the, yeah, with the nuclear bomb, I'm not going to pretend like I know how a nuclear bomb would change in space. Um I know that there wouldn't be the like obviously fire because there's no like there's nothing to set on fire in space um as far as i know it would just be yeah. a massive release of uh like radiation like it would just be the radioactive um no without any fallout and without any uh, fire it would just be a massive thermal radioactive event um which yeah that according well, yeah because that's why i was curious yeah yeah, according to this, would just be enough to power the ship forward, um, as a means of mm-hmm. as a means of motion. Um, but yeah, no, that, that, that's all. I, I'm not an expert on Project Orion either. I just wanted to sort of throw it out there as if, if anyone was curious how how aliens could possibly bridge this gap. Um, that's one of the main. Yeah, well, I. <laughs> I don't think they would have been setting off atomic bombs because we would have obviously noticed that. Like if, if in space, uh, like just a bunch of bombs being like, <laughs> like don't uh, you think we would notice like a lot of like, like this, like we would notice the disturbance or so within our solar system. Uh, within like close to our planet, yes, but I'm not so sure about like, um, something like between stars. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. as far as I know, like a nuclear and also. Bomb- Oh, sorry. Yeah, and then that's only good if you need to like do interstellar travel, right? It's not good for, like so no matter like if you take out like the interstellar travel, then you like it's just essentially like a very fast spacecraft is what we're getting, right? Right? Well, yeah, interstellar travel isn't different than any other kind of space travel. It's just um it's not that there's something between stars that stops us from getting between them or anything. It's just the reason I focus oh, on I, these I, I know that I just, yeah, it's, it takes so much time if you use like earthly methods of transport that what we're really looking for is like, yeah. how could you possibly move a ship? How could anyone in the universe possibly move a ship between stars in the lifetime of one life form? Um, which another hypothesis would just be that aliens live for thousands of years and it's not a long trip for them. Um, but yeah well yeah that that would be like more my theory because like i know that you know even like humans trying to get to mars takes like four or five years i think to get to like one way it's not even like both so you you know i I do know it does take you know a long time like to travel like through space i'm just like seeing like okay like obviously like aliens are going to be way more advanced within their technology and that they're able to like travel like incredibly fast like throughout space. I just don't know like necessarily like if they've like left the solar system, but it's just because like they we just never been detected within our solar system until like like there's been a couple occurrences of like Earth, but not really like much else, you know. That's the yeah, which is sort of where my skepticism of the con the the reason that I'm skeptical of aliens not necessarily that i dismiss them outright but why i'm skeptical is that 
there are very few, although, I mean, I don't know how much, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but there, there, there's only about two places, two to three places in the solar system where it looks like life could live. Um, and then the outside the solar system, there are lots of places where life could live, but those places are so vastly distant from us that we're looking at, yeah, the sort of technology, these sort of advanced space flight technologies um that yeah i don't know and it's it sort of yeah and we're, either way neither explanation quite works entirely um but yeah that you you pretty much summarized it yeah of course yeah well man i guess now now i'm like on like nuclear bombs and i just like think about like the film industry because of oppenheimer that was just recently relieved have you seen that movie yet i have not seen oppenheimer no Oh man, we gotta watch that film. I haven't seen it either. I've heard like it's a really well done film, but you know, I'm just like curious of like your opinion because I know like there's been like the writer's strike as of recently, and right. Hollywood was just kind of been almost placed on pause because of all the writers leaving because it's like, well, you're not able to develop films. Like even Sony, like the studio, I read somewhere that apparently they're having to cut back a lot on their budgets for next year because like they're not able to get the writers and they're thinking that it's going to prolong the strike so much. So they're not going to be able to produce movies. So they're not going to be making any profit and they're going to have to significantly reduce like the budget on their future films when they are able to release post strike. And I'm curious, do you think that this is like a needed reset of Hollywood? Like given like all of the films that have been released, cause I know the writers, they've been crunched on time and they're not able to, you know, they're not even re redeeming any of the profits from their movies because of streaming platforms and all oh, there's the concern of AI, which I think is a little bit of an over-exaggerated fear. However, I'm just curious of, do you think that like Hollywood needs to like take a pause and almost like reset for their future projects and focus on more like indie films, like in developments or like, like what's your opinion on that? Cause I know like Marvel and DC and all of these like major franchises like our remakes are like the essential focus of Hollywood because it's safe. What's your opinion on that? Okay. Well, there's a, there's a lot to give my opinion on there. Um, yeah, that's all right. I didn't mean to overload all those questions. I, I, from, I, from what I, from what I know about Hollywood, there is a, there is a, a large issue of, I guess, like, oversaturation is the best word for it where i saw even a few years ago the facts that most hollywood movies bomb and i didn't realize this but it takes like i i thought it was one success to fund one failure but it's looking more like a success mm -hmm. to fund five failures um as far as like what actually succeeds in this industry which makes sense because if you think about like a how rarely people go to see movies and then not only how rarely people go to see them but of those movies what people talk about and, and what they see is fairly niche um like i don't know maybe it's just my experience but the these numbers seem to line up with um even my circles where you talk to people and there's usually one or two movies in theaters that people are talking about and considering going to see yeah, And then the rest are kind of out to lunch. And we've seen, I've seen people talk about how comedies don't really come out much anymore. Uh, you remember it used to be there was one like huge big budget comedy every year. And even that sort of slowed down. Um, well, not even like big budget, but there were like kind of like mid-sized projects. And I know that uh, there was this one actor, he was in Pitch Perfect. I can't remember his name. A uh, good comedian, but he was talking about how a large amount of the franchises, like you know, all these MCU films, are really taking away a lot of the funds for these comedy projects because they're doing like very simple comedy. And we've like, well, we've all seen like the MCU films. It's like you know, action, action, action. Then they stop, brief joke, haha, -ha, and that's it. And a large amount of these studios would rather fund these action projects and superhero projects or remakes that have these little bits of spread of comedy instead of investing in a pure comedy film because it's so hard to market and to get people in the seats to watch those films, you know? So I think that's like, you know, 
it's it's really just like these like fr- like you know I find franchises that have kind of ruined the market for a lot of films. Yeah, yeah, I definitely know what you mean. I think I actually watched the same podcast, um, with with Adam Devine, and and he was talking about that. Where, That's his name. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, where for sure there is this issue of I think in the era of you know remakes and sequels and reboots and sequel boots it's <laughs> it's definitely kind of a ma it's hard to find originality and in that there's a lot of movies which are sort of made to be funny but not too raunchy right like making sure you can still bring your kids to it um and action packed but also yeah. not like too action heavy right you want to be able to bring the whole family here you can't have rambo blowing up people um and maybe political but not political in any meaningful way right where it just sort of like hammers a few symbols into your skull without really grappling with you know heavier topics because it's got to appeal to everyone and i think these watered down sort of safe cgi fests (laughs) that have become commonplace and i think this year is kind of the breaking point where we didn't just see it break from the writer side of writers saying, Hey guys, you need to pay us properly. Otherwise we're not going to work. But also on the uh, consumer side where we've seen a lot of movies bomb this year. Like, I don't know if you saw, but like Shazam fury of the gods bombed the flash bombed. Oh yeah. Was a toilet fest. Um, And I'm not quite, um, I'm not quite even a mob upset about this because i feel like those are examples of movies that um not to diss anyone's preferences but none of those movies looked good um in in any way in my opinion so i yeah i can definitely see that that's an issue uh and yeah i'd have to say i'm on i'm on the same page there yeah well i mean you know speaking on those like films like it it just kind of seemed like it did well I want to say Marvel, but it's really Disney at this point, because you can look at all of the films that have been released under Disney's belt, you know, Indiana Jones five and, you know, like all of the MCU films, like you had, like, just like you said, Ant-Man three and, uh, well, there's a couple like Pixar movies that have been, what was it? Like there was elementals, which was actually like decent, but like it was just poorly marketed, but I know that like Bob Iger, like who is like the CEO of Disney just kind of has like this weird philosophy where he's like, Oh, like, let me just like do this monopoly of buying all of these studios and then remaking them, recycling the content and putting like the least amount of effort into making these films actually good. Like, I don't know where, like why in recent times it's like, instead of it just being, Hey, why don't we actually get practical stuff or, how about we invest in like these led screens? Like, you know, the Mandalorian was actually like, I was actually kind of happy to see because they were more innovative and like, let's make an actual backdrop that reflects the lighting. So we don't have to digitally, you know, artificially light the scene and post, but it's just like, they just like spend hundreds of millions of dollars in like this shitty CGI. And then they're like putting stress on these VFX artists and it looks awful. Like the little mermaid, like, did you know they're merrily making Moana? They're remaking it. Oh, the the first one that is so film is less than ten years old. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh yeah, so long. They're remaking it, dude. And Dwayne Johnson announced it like we're making live action Moana, and I'm like, bro, that was not just made in like tw- was it 2015, 2016? I think it was 2016. Maybe it was yeah. even sooner. Well, yeah, yeah like that happened, film was yeah. just made. And they yeah. want to remake it. And it's like, it's sad because it's seeing Disney that used to be the symbol of creativity and, you know, brilliance of animation has just gone down the fucking toilet. And I don't know. Like, and I feel bad for Pixar. Pixar gets shot on a lot for no reason. They made, they've, they have made good films. They've just been having a poor run. I think, do you think Disney's trying to screw them over in actuality? Uh, I can't speak to whether Disney, I, I won't, I won't make conjecture either way on that. Cause I just, I don't know. Um, I will say, yeah, like Pixar isn't, 
as good as it used to be. I can say that much. But is it that they're not as good as they used to be? Or when they try to make their own original projects, Disney doesn't support them? Oh, it's tough to say. I mean, I, I can say this. Disney has always had uh, like ups and downs in its history of movie making. Like the, I don't, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't remember exactly the, all the names, but they had the Disney Golden Age, right? Which is where all of their classics like Jungle Book and Pinocchio and, um, and yeah, like uh, Snow White came out, like their sort of original heyday. And then they had what was called like, yeah. uh, I think it was called Car and Sandpaper Era, which is a bunch of movies that most people haven't heard of, like The Black Cauldron <laughs> and, um, uh, and, uh, I Aristocats and I think I think actually the only good one might have been Fox and the Hound. But then, you know, after that they had Hey, hey, uh, hey, 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 hold up, hold up. Aristocats was the jam. Do not disrespect the Aristocats. Anyways. Um but it, it it's just been sort of been seen as is not as good even if I I like a few of those films. Um but the um but then of course the the, the era of Disney that everyone hails as being the you know the best and brightest the there was the 90s was their 90s stuff right they called the disney renaissance yeah and i don't need to name the films there like everyone knows those are masterpieces everyone loves them even i think people who hate disney you know have an appreciation for them on some level um but then after that they decided to make you know dinosaur and (laughs) whatever other like um chicken little okay okay this is what I will say. This is what I will say. Okay. And because you mentioned the good dinosaur, do you remember what the film that came after was? I do not. Okay. I am pretty sure like the next film, wasn't it Coco? Uh, yes. Yes. I think it was Coco. Yeah. I got to have to look this up because it's almost what's it called? Uh, yeah, when they made the oh, it was Finding Dory, then Cars Three, then Coco. Okay, that's what we skip over things. But yeah. I think that with like Disney, it just seems like they're not giving their like full confidence in marketing for Pixar unless it's a sequel to something. So Coco, even the Coco was a really great film, right? But I don't think it was like do you was it wasn't really well marketed I I can't quite remember I don't remember like seeing a lot of like uh, advertising for it I, I remember being somewhat marketed not really heavily though no Yeah but you know there's a lot of marketing for Cars 3 and Incredibles 2 though right Yes I remember that And Toy Story 4 Yes But barely nothing for Onward right Onward was ghosted Yeah it was just a silent release Now this is what pisses me off and that like soul and Luca were not even shown in the theaters and they tried to say it was because of COVID, which I understand there was some limitations, but I feel like it was coming out of the end of COVID and they just put it on their streaming platform for free. And it's the fact that both of those films were really well done. And it just seems like that because Disney was still releasing their major films in theaters, but they decided to do a set like, you know, Disney plus release of soul and Luca, which were both really well done. Creative films from Pixar. I, okay. And to me, it gives the impression that they almost like, kind of want to like make it to this, like, you know, that they just want to release like sequel after sequel. I don't know. Maybe maybe that sounds a little too off or weird. I do I do agree. Um I, I can speak to that. I do think that there's sequels um of the last decade or so. And by last decade I mean like not the twenty tens, I just mean like t- from today that minus ten years. Um I, I think that their sequel game has been off. Uh, and the reason I say that is because yeah, like they do feel like they're kind of just trying to play it safe. Uh, I don't know about you, but like Finding Dory wasn't particularly excellent. Um, Cars 2 and 3. No, it wasn't. I didn't see Cars 3. Cars 2 was just so bad. Um, 
uh, incredible. Actually, Garcia was an improvement. Car Carsley was an improvement because of how bad Cars 2 was. Do you know what happened in Cars 3? I have actually heard people say that Cars 3 was arguably even better than 1. Um, but I just... Mm, okay, I wouldn't, go, I wouldn't go that far, but they understood the issue of 2. And do you want to know how 2 was even released the way it was and why it was so bad? How? Oh. The reason why was because Cars did so good. And like, uh, no, okay, there's more to that. It's like, it was a great release. It was popular amongst the kids and it sold a lot of toys. And Disney was like, guys, you need to make a second one and you need to make it better. And you need to make so many like different action figures and toys for this film in order to like, you know, to make us more money. So the studio was like get, being pressured immensely to release. And then they wanted them to also release it like within like, um, with less time to develop the movie during the summer, I think. Like, I, I can't remember. How many years was apart from the first and second Cars movie? Do you know? Ooh, I can look that up really easily. Um, Cars 2011 two for Cars 2. Okay. Okay, I got Cars 2. That was 2011. Okay, so five years later, they developed Cars 2. So they got, they did have a development time. But they wanted to make a genuine sequel, and they were kind of rushed, so they just did an average spy thriller so they could have different models of, you know, Lightning McQueen and all these side characters and Toe Mater because they wanted to... They Everybody liked Toe Mater the first one because it was Larry the Cable Guy. So they just went really, like, heavily, like, into, like, just being Toe Mater the story. And as you can... As you know, it was a really horrible story as well. But... The third one was so much better because they f decided to go back to Lightning McQueen, put Tomato in the background, and they wanted to focus on like a, a guy like who is struggling to race and can't keep it up. And I feel like there's another story that's similar to that because, oh yeah, it's Monsters University. Oh my god, they're so similar. Um, it just clicked in now. Do you know like that like how they're similar? Uh, well, okay. Full disclosure. I did not like Cars 1, and I did not love Toe Mater, <laughs> and I did not want to see Cars 2, and I think I am, uh, I think maybe my class was going to go see it, but I, like, skipped out on it because I didn't want to see it, and Cars 3 I didn't even bother with because I was older and I didn't have to see it, but no, so I, I can't say I, I didn't see Cars 3, but I did see Monsters University, so I, I can speak to that film um what yeah, was your so, opinion on that film um i think monsters university is of the new pixar sequels it's arguably the best um like of all the ones they've made recently that sort of seem to sort of be like making a sequel for the sake of make, making a sequel um i think it's better like i think it's better than toy story 4 um i think it's better than the cars trilogy and i think it's better than a ma what you call it incredibles too but i also i can't say it quite oh definitely um yeah i, I, can't I would it. argue that it's better than the first one i remember thinking that when i saw it actually in grade six yeah i thought i'm uh wow <laughs> what a diss oh yeah i remember thinking that same opinion back in grade six yeah no like, i'm just joking yeah, like, but I'm like, oh. i well I, I, I've watched it recently and I really like it because the story itself, the message is actually kind of like, it's sad, but it's like, you know, reasonable because as you know, in the story, like Mike Wazowski, he's not able to make it as a scarer. He's come to the realization and the, you know, near the end of the film that not everybody's dream is going to work in reality. And sometimes you need to accept that. However, you can still find your own way to achieve something similar. And that yeah. message has never really like been like demonstrated, you know, ever like that's like a really like good message to bring into a film because it's, it's applicable. Although it's easy to say like, you can do your dreams as much as you want, no matter how hard you make it, but that's not always the case. There's going to be limitations in everybody's case. Right. And now the connection to, Cars 3 is that 
Lightning McQueen is trying to race all these other like, you know, cars and vehicles that are practically Formula One and they're just he's not able to beat them because, you know, he's he's getting older and there's all of these other like race cars that are super fast. Right. The whole movie works through him trying to train and get up to that moment. And then as he's actually on the race, he comes to the realization that he needs to like he, he can't do it forever and he needs to retire. He tries his best. But he ultimately gives it to this uh, to an individual he's been training in the entire film. I forget her name. This other Chris car driver, and she ends up winning the race. And the whole point is like, you know, you got to know when to to pull back yeah. and be like, you know what, I'm not the best anymore, but I got to pass along my legacy, you know. And yeah. that was just a really good message. And it's kind of similar to Monsters University in that it's not you can't always achieve those dreams. However. You can live vicariously through somebody else. And which that's the case for both films, right? Where Mike Wazowski living through Sully right. as like, you know, his never, never success as a scammer. Yeah, I I'm not even joking, dude. I just came up with that on the spot. And I wish I could say I'm lying, but I'm not. <laughs> no, you're right. That that actually really holds together. Um Yeah, I was gonna say Boom. Uh, gonna, what else could be Take that, that YouTube? <laughs> Yeah. Um no, that's that's I, actually quite, I like the apples. No, that's actually quite an interesting take. Um yeah, I was going to say unfortunately, I've actually missed a lot of Pixar's work in the last couple of years. Like I haven't seen Onward. I haven't seen Turning Red. It's I a trash seen... film. Don't watch it. Turning I Red's have... amazing though. Turning Red I, I'm I'm actually going to like go through it. Okay, and what you should watch. Because I, I've kept up semi like semi kept up with them. So Turning Red, great film. A lot of people try to make it political and shit like that. It's not. It's not. It's just a great fun film for kids. Um and I mildly enjoyed it. Artwork is amazing, animation style is great. In fact, I'm pretty sure the individual, the director went to a college located in Oakville, the film college there. Sheridan, oh, wow. I think, is it? Yeah, yeah, I went to the Sheridan Art School. So, you know, Canadian filmmaker, I think. I don't know if the director was Canadian, but I do know. Well, they the whole premise is that it's located in Toronto, which is cool. So I would strongly recommend seeing that film. Really good time. Uh, Elementals, just poorly marketed. They marked it as if it was like Zootopia, but instead it was fire and water. That's not the case whatsoever. It's actually quite a sweet story. And it's really well done. And it's not a bad film. It's actually like quite sweet. Because sure the director like took film. in his own life experiences. Huh? It sure looks like a bad film, to be honest. Um, it does. It does look like a bad film. The director actually like took a lot of his own experiences from when he was an immigrant, I believe. So oh. it takes in that kind of side. Yeah. So, and, and that's kind of like the film. It's like, yeah, they're going to like a new city for like a better opportunities, but like the fire um, beings, I guess in this world, like they actually like established that like each of the elements like have their own kind of culture that they've been a part of. And they've like come into like live into this kind of like, it's not exactly a utopia because there's problems like the fire, like that they've established that their community, it's like there's like water pipes that are run everywhere, even though they're not supposed to be running through the fire territory because it could kill them. Right. You know, but they, it's kind of like, you know, there's stuff like that or water. Like it's like, you know, looked on as like the great, you know, they're awesome and there's no problems with them. But in reality, it's like they can have their own issues as well. It's a really interesting film. You should definitely check it out. I I thought it was going to be trash, and it ended up being really well done. And what did? Yeah, what did there's you... there's plenty of like. Oh, sorry. No, continue. So what? Sorry, continue. No, sorry. no, you go, you go, you go. I was gonna say, what did you think of? Uh... No. Huh. Of. Oh, I think you said no. Um, I said, what did you think of Luca? Amazing film. At first, surprisingly, I didn't like it that much. Um, 
because the reason, okay, I was a little biased when I first watched it because I watched Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs and I saw Flit, like Flit Lockwood's dad, mustache, burly guy, fisherman, let's go for the team. And he was like the best character in that movie because it could show like that you could do a lot of emotions without very crazy expressions. He can do it just by like the furrow of his brows and everything because he had a unibrow, right? And he didn't need eyes in order to like give context. And that was amazing. And then what I didn't like about Luca was that they took the same character, barely remodeled him differently and put him as a fisherman. And it was so similar that it kind of made me a bit biased on the film upon my first watch. And then I actually like ended up enjoying it and I watched it again and I very much enjoyed the film. It's simple. It's just kind of a nice time. You know what I mean? It's cute. I agree. I think it's a a movie that has a a good it has the right amount of charm. Uh it has it it's about friendship. It's about kids finding their way in the world. I also think that the the setting is pretty interesting. I like the color choices of the 1950s Italy turquoise water and turquoise like appliances and stuff against like yeah. the sort of earthy burgundy almost a red but more of a brown um bricks and like stones of the city um which i find i just found that to be a really interesting sort of like color choice right of like yeah the beige and turquoise yeah. combination um along with right all the different like kind of like greens and whatnot greens and golds but um yeah luca luca was a really nice film um it felt like pixar kind of getting back to its roots i would argue that it's uh-huh. as far as the recent pixar films i mean like luca was in my opinion um like i don't i i haven't seen all the films on the list but i suspect it's better than onward and turning red and Lightyear and elemental um, but that's just my opinion. Turning yeah. Red's a Turning Red's a good film, man. Like I, I'm not even joking. It looked like it was going to be bad. I, I'm not even joking. When I first saw it, I thought it was going to be a film about anxiety. So I'm like, okay, so we're getting a, a slight off brand Inside Out. And then I watched the film, and it was really well done. I'm not even joking. It's not what you think. Again, this is where I'm getting into like you know my issue with Disney, and I feel like that their marketing has been very poor in regards to Pixar creative films. It seems like, and this again, this might be this might just be my own opinion, and it might not have any form of grounds whatsoever. It just seems like Disney is purposely like to the worth their own shareholders and everything. They're marketing these films poor, so then they can go to the shareholders and be like, "Hey guys, look." These creative films are not doing well. You know what does well? Sequels. Look at Incredibles 2. It got way more than like its first film, which was like seen as a masterpiece of its time. It's beyond great. And if we just keep focusing on nostalgia and capturing all of these like older like audiences from like their memories of childhood, we can consistently like milk out fun- like money for them for no without any cost. And this is what I'm getting at. It just kind of feels like that with a large amount of the films, like all of their creative endeavors are not being marketed and shown. And they're and when they are marketed, they're shown as like a like like an awful film. And this is why I get into like turning red. When I first watched the trailer, I was like, dude, like this trailer sucks. And I don't know why the movie's so good and the trailer suck for it. And you know, even I'll, I'll even say, like, even when I watched, um, what's it called? Um, what's that film we were just talking about? It wasn't Luca, it wasn't Soul. Uh, Elementals. Decent film. It's not bad whatsoever. It's actually quite good. It's not excellent. It's just good. And, you know, it's a nice, nice little animated film. But it was marketed like Zootopia with, um, like, again, with elements. And uh, like, that's why I didn't want to see it, too. I'm like, this looks cringe, you know? And the jokes were like the worst jokes in the film. There's a lot better jokes in the film, you know? And I don't know. It just makes me like sad that like Disney's kind of resorting to that. Even if you look at Bob Iger's plan for the next phase of movies, it's just a bunch of sequels and sequels. Yeah, Toy Story 5. I'm sorry. This might offend people. Toy Story 4 was a pile of shit. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I that might that. upset some people. It was a pile of shit. I went to watch that film. I was expecting to be wowed. Animation looks flawless. Don't get me wrong, but it sucked. You could tell this is not working. And I, I, everybody was crying, apparently like crying. Like, this is the thing. The articles were like, oh, the ending's so sad. The ending's so sad. And I'm like, no, it's not. I'm sorry. I didn't shed a tear because this milk was clearly just a milk fucking cash cow to milk money out of people. I could tell that right away. Like, do you know what happens, Kayla? Do you want to spoil it? Yeah, spoil the ending for me. Okay. So really quickly, Bo Peep's introduced into the story. This is like the huge kind of like plot device that's like bringing it like, you know, the the conflict of the film per se. And that uh, you have Woody, like he had a crush on Bo Peep, as we know from the original films. And there's this whole thing where Woody's kind of like, maybe I should leave the gang and like not be just a toy anymore and kind of go on adventures with Bo Peep. That is the story. And it's like, okay, fine. You want to do that? Whatever. In the end, it's essentially that Woody decides to leave with Bo Peep and he gives a handshake to Buzz Lightyear and says, like, so long, partner. That's it. Right. Okay. So he he leaves. Um Yeah. And I'm sorry, but it's just not that strong of a story. It, it to me it wasn't they it's just Forky, and Forky was the most pissed off of a character i've never been so angered by stupidity of a character oh my lord i i was so done with it dude and like because a stupid character was like i'm trash and it's like you're fucking right you are and the developers know this too (laughs) you're fucking trash dude and it was it was an awful film just to say the least um but anyways, that's what happens in four. So I'm like, what are you going to do for Toy Story five? If, in my opinion, Toy Story three should have been a definitive ending. It was great. That film yes. made me cry when I was young. God damn, that was hard. This like, oh my heart. Oh god. But the fourth one had no soul in it. That's my opinion. And you could tell that the even the filmmakers when they're making it, they only cared about how it looked. Because even in interviews, they're like, yeah, we really focused hard on making the water droplets really like seem like it's right there. And we try to get each of the individualized grains of sand to dissipate in front of you in the water. And it's like, buddy, I came here to watch a film, a story. I didn't come here to marvel at your animation skills. And I feel like this is the, again, the direction that a large amount of these animations are taking and when it's a creative endeavor, it's not being, you know, celebrated or shown off by Disney. It's just being hidden in the fucking, you know, back seats, the back burner, whatever. Like, Luca was a great yeah. film. Looks amazing. Story's great. Poorly marketed. I didn't see any of the marketing for that film, did you? No, I didn't. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I saw it because i actually had a sibling who really really loved it and was like really really trying to pressure me to to watch it and i'm glad they did because man was it a masterpiece but you're right luca didn't have much marketing um a lot of the pixar movies haven't had much marketing i think arguably it's just because maybe the sequelization of these things isn't um prof yeah I, i don't know but the the lack of marketing and i think even just the lack of like originality generally um like yeah there's only so many items that pixar can make come to to life you know i don't necessarily need to see talking gas pumps and and i think that they're at the point where they're starting to run thin on ideas and maybe need i don't know need to do some better brainstorming because well i don't think i don't think it's a matter of like not able to create ideas i think it's just that a large amount of their like these studios are not wanting to take risks on independent creative projects. You got to keep in mind, Caleb, creativity doesn't just run dry all of a sudden. There's always new people, new artists who want to show off their own stories. It's the fact that these studios and like art and financiers are not actually taking risks or even like, just be like, yo, yeah, you can do it, but we're going to give you a small budget. You know, that's not even happening now. 
You know, the only yeah. studio that's doing that that I can see is A24. Um, wait, uh, there's, okay, there's a small caveat. There might be a lot more, but that's like the major studio brand that I can think of that. And by the way, I just want to point out that when I mean like A24, it's just that like they give very small budgets to these independent directors and they give them creative liberties. And I okay. like seeing that in a lot of films. I will say though, um, I do think mm-hmm. there's a few store there's a few studios that deserve more credit than that. Um, yeah, again, this is the one that comes to mind. There are plenty of studios that do like, that. That comics waves film stuff, um, has been good. I don't know if you saw your name, uh, or. Or um, uh, or Suzume, but those two films did incredibly well, um, as far as critical yeah. acclamation. And the other one, which is a lot smaller, is Cartoon Saloon, which apparently Apple bought. Um, but they made a few animated films that are actually Irish. It's an Irish studio, and they made a few animated films. So I do think that there are good indie animated studios that are are making good films. It's just not necessarily Pixar. Oh yeah, there there is. Well, Pixar is making good films. I I don't want to like seem like they're not. They are. They like they still have it in them, and they're still getting new artists and stuff. It's just that I, you know, they're just not getting the push from their own, like you know, studio Disney. And that's yeah. what I like. It seems like just demonstrated because they're making great films. Like again, Elementals wasn't that bad. It's not that they're losing that mojo. It's just that it seems like they're not getting like the same push because Disney keeps releasing a bunch of films and they're losing money left, right, and center, and now they don't want to take risks. Yeah, yeah, I, I can agree with that analysis. Um, do you think that... Because you want to know, you want to know why all the... F- oh, sorry, you go, you go. I was going to say, yeah, do you think that they're going to hit a breaking point that's going to end up cutting this back or... Yeah, like, what do you think the what do you well, think the breaking point of all this is? Well, this is why I mentioned the the writer strike because I feel like there's going to there's a major pause that's happening, and where they need to like consider the strike. They can't really they're, like they're not producing new films because of it. They've had to halt a couple times for some films, and I really hope that with the writer strike. It's maybe an epiphany that they need to reevaluate a couple things. One, we can't just be producing content for the sake of content. And essentially what I'm saying is that if we look at MCU, phase four is an example of content upon content because you're just putting a lot of stuff onto their streaming platforms so it's filled but there's nothing that's actually of value. It's just content. You can watch yeah, it and it's, it's okay, is, but it's 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 nothing surreal. And and that's yeah, the problem. Well, Secret invasion, trash. Like, you know. Yeah, sorry, you, was, you can you can elaborate yeah, more I if you I like. Didn't, I didn't even see it, but I saw like it looked really, really bad. Um yeah, like Yeah, the- She Hulk trash well well i think the problem is yeah just oversaturation a lack of original writing um mm-hmm. i was gonna say um uh as far as the shows go i think there's arguably two good ones um only two okay i would say loki was decent it was decent um and the hawkeye show looked good i didn't see it but it looked good um and yeah, and I, I kind of wish I watched more of that. Uh, yeah. I, I never watched Miss Marvel, but um, I know that, okay, WandaVision was okay, but got really bad near the end, and which which was kind of sad because it, it had a really cool theme going on. But going going back to my original point, what made these like or, like it better originally, like we got to go back like to 2000s, okay? And where... When Bob Iger was first getting the studios, there was Pixar that released like a couple of films and it got the attention of the studio. They're like, yo, they're making really good animated films. Let's buy them. And then they bought them and then they were still making animated films, but 
they weren't really like enforcing too much on them. It allowed them to breathe and market them, whatever. Then they bought Marvel. Then they bought Lucasfilm. Then they bought all these other films. But this was in the 2000s where Disney didn't really like have like a huge like power, like hungry hold on everybody. It was just that they bought them just to buy them. So they were still getting like money from these projects. It's more when you get into like the 2010s is where they kind of recognize, or maybe 2012 maybe, is where they recognize that they could milk out these projects and make more remakes of stuff in order to, you know, take nostalgia to get money. Like, you can even see, like, the quality of the MCU went downhill, in my opinion. Like, it, there was a couple wavering things that happened during even the first three phases of the MCU. Like, when they first started, this is what I liked. Phase one, each one of those films was unique. They had a certain feel, a certain look. There was a story that was told that wasn't connected. It was just on its own. Iron Man. It was kind of raunchy comedy in a couple sections. Great action. Good story. Robert Downey Jr. was the man. Do you know what film they made after that? The Incredible Hulk with Ed Norton. Wow, what a piece of Great film. Its own thing. Huh? I would say garbage. You say it's garbage. I think it's... That Hulk was fucking scary, man. I don't give a shit what you say. That was That's a scary looking Hulk. Two films I won't rewatch. Um, yeah, I thought it you was, should yeah, rewatch it. It was actually a well done film. It was actually a well done film. Over Phase One of Marvel is kind of overrated, to be honest. Um, because like Hulk, you, you say Captain overrated, America. but I. Yeah, but like Captain America was a really well was a good film too. Again, what I'm saying here though is that like the first phase of films, what I at least liked about it was that it was unique in every single way. It was like you had, you know, when you had Captain America, it was like okay, he's his own kind of thing. World War II film, what that's cool. Incredible Hulk, horror film, monster film, great Iron Man. Multi billionaire, raw, raw, I don't know, robot mechanic, whatever you want to call superhero, whatever. And then they made Thor, which you actually celebrated as a really remarkable film for its time. Yes, I think Thor is a really, really good movie. It's massively underrated yeah. in Disney. Exactly. And then was it? Was there any other film, or is it just Avengers or Iron Man Two? Oh, yes, Iron Man 2, which was a okay film. We're going to say okay. But going back to essentially what I'm getting here is there was a really cool um, direction that each hero took. And then when it came to Avengers, it seemed like, yo, these are a bunch of different people that are put together. And it's really remarkable to see them try to fight as a team. And I like that like that thing. When you get into like the phase two and phase three, it's not that there wasn't good films, there was, but you could see that there was a bit of a formula going on with them and that the humor was starting to become more noticeable and formulaic. Yes. That's what I'm yes, getting at. It wasn't like, let's make a film for the drama and that's relatable to the character. It quickly became, let's make this a formula so we can make it a little easier. And it, it got really bad in phase four because I just were just pure on formula and lack of story. Yeah. And that's my yeah. ar argument I'm making here. Yeah, you're and right. I feel like it's starting to kind of like, sorry, you go. Yeah. Would you say though that I'm uh, during phase three, they kind of brought it back. Cause I actually think that Marvel actually peaked at like infinity war, in my opinion, that it actually did get better and better. Yeah. Um, it peaked, but there were still moments. I'll be honest, dude. Infinity War and Endgame, what pissed me off is that they would like break such great dramatic moments with humor. Yeah. Yeah. Like true. so many, dude. So many. And it, it kind of pissed me off, you know, where it's like, dude, like, why does Marvel feel this need to like add in humor? And I know that it's because of Disney, not because of Marvel itself. Kevin Feige is a pretty, like, you know, smart guy when it comes to, like, making a formula for the entire universe of Marvel. And that, the, like, he made phases for a reason to tell a story. And this is why when you get to the end of phase three, it was a complete 
saga. It was the Infinity War like saga, right? Yes. And when you go past that, they didn't know what to do. So now they're trying to get Kane as the big baddie, but the problem was is that he wasn't even seen as the big baddie until a little after Loki. Like even in Loki, it's just people liked him. So then Marvel's like, okay, I guess we're gonna rewrite everything to make it for Kang, the Conqueror. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And they, they tried to mark This is why I agree with not working. Exactly. Which which is why I agree with James Gunn and that he was like, listen, you can't make a bunch of films without discussing a plan first. You need to have an established story and plan before you can continue to make these films. This is the problem for why DC EU failed. There was no plan. Zack Snyder was just going <laughs> off on different, yeah. like James Gunn, or like, I'm sorry, not James Gunn, Zack Snyder, dude, was like, he was horrible at planning these films out. Horrible. I'm sorry. Like, I like the Justice League, kind of, <laughs> like the film of uh, Zack Snyder, but I it was a mess. Was there was, was no trash. organization. You thought it was trash, really? Yeah, I hated both. You didn't like, like I, his six hour mad. He didn't like his six hour cut. The uh, Snyder the cut first one was bad, and the second one was like slightly better. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, nothing great. Yeah, but... it was very pretentious. It was very pretentious. Yes, in my that, opinion, it was um, like too much slow mo. Oh, like it. I don't know. Well, and then the makeup rated R. Okay, this is this is what kind of pissed me off, dude. This is this is what pissed me off. You made your entire franchise PG thirteen. Okay, so you're telling me you just filmed one rated R film out of nowhere? Yeah, that's a bit hard to really get away with. Um, to believe. Yeah, I believe he shot a lot of stuff, but I don't believe that like he added all of these like f bombs into it and beheadings and blood and Wonder Woman killing all of a sudden. <laughs> like, yeah, come on, it's it, it's difficult to it's difficult to sort of defend that. Um, I do think that with the the tragedy of the MCU is that the thing is that Thanos really was the big build up of the whole thing. But after he died, yeah. um, yeah, even after he died, it was kind of like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it took away the steam of the whole thing, which, by the way, I also will say even Thanos was kind of haphazardly done as a villain, because if you really look at his plot, the arc of Thanos is that he shows up in an MCU movie and then gets defeated. And then shows up again and gets defeated and he kind of has the, you know, like, oh, we'll meet again type, you know, endings to these movies. But if you really look at him, like until Infinity yeah. War, he wasn't really cool because he got defeated in Avengers and in Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, which kind of makes him a lame villain. And then even once they put him in, they had the big fight and it was amazing. Infinity War and Endgame were amazing. But after that, it was kind of like, OK, but this is a. Um, uh, yeah, but this is this is done. Um, like we gotta just wrap it up now. Like the 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 movie that they made right after. Do you wanna know what, what movie do you, you remember them making right after they made Endgame? Ant Man two. No, actually, it was a uh, Spider Man. Um, it was Spy. Uh, you're thinking of Infinity War. Infinity War. No, it wasn't. Right. Oh shit! You're right. You're right. My bad. I sorry. You. I. I for some reason I saw. I remember in Infinity War, and then I was like, "Yeah, the next film I saw was Ant Man too." And I was like, "Oh right, you're right." You. You said End Game. So yeah, you said Spider Man, like, like No Way Home. Yeah. Um, or no, no Spider Man Far From Home. Yeah, That's what it was. Um, oh, I hated that film. You liked it so much, and I hated it. Uh, I'd say I like it because I like the villain a lot, but you're right. It's not a great movie. I actually couldn't even really finish it the second time. Um, or the third time rather. No, it's not. It's far from Marvel's best work because yeah, like they lost their steam. Uh, <laughs> Marvel was meant to end after. Yeah. Marvel was meant to end after, the, um, end game. 
Um, and all of their best movies, I think, came out pretty much before then. Has anything come out since Onto Game, which has been like prime mm-hmm. Marvel content? Not, not that I can remember. Um, but yeah, no, especially I, I agree with you. They've kind of they've gone downhill. Yeah, well, I don't know. It makes me sad, and hopefully, like, that's going to be a wake up call for like all of like Hollywood. That in order to make good films, you need to invest in directors. You need to give them a little more creative freedom. And if you just invest in those projects, there's going to be a max return. Because honestly, I, I don't get where like this big budget movies came from, but that were like as a necessity. Like, even if you look at older horror films right like halloween you realize that film had like basically no budget in order to make yeah and that required like just pure creativity and it's like why can't you recreate the success just go to some direct you see this is what i mean okay a24's talk to me i don't know if you've seen the reviews apparently that film's really fucking good as a horror movie low budget give them creative freedom and you get a really well done film. And it's like these, like these executives are just like, Oh, we need to like, we need to go with safe. Let's invest $200 million into Harrison Ford at fucking set. Was he 77 years old now? Let's have that's yeah. a sequel film for him and then destroy his character. They destroyed his character in that film. I heard that. I don't know if you yeah, realize. Like, really Crystal definitely. Skull is actually better than this film. Oh, yeah. I'm not surprised, though. Like, So, you know, you're doing yeah. something wrong. You know, you're doing something wrong. And yeah. I also don't like how they're involving time travel in this film, too. You realize it's involving time travel? What? Oh, I guess that makes Dial of Destiny. Yeah. Um, of course. Of course. Bringing time travel into it. Why not? Um, it's like aliens was always hard to believe. Honestly, the hardest part in this entire franchise is believing Harrison Ford was going to survive that nuclear bomb. <laughs> that was a cool yeah. moment. I don't care what people say. <laughs> was, oh God, that was an amazing moment. It just goes, I like how the fridge itself says lead insulated. I'm like, are you fucking kidding? Do you know how lucky you gotta be to see a fridge that tells you the exact thing that's going to protect you? Hey, he he got lucky, but uh, yeah, that's uh, I guess that's what it took to keep Mister Jones alive or Doctor Jones alive. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, that was that was pretty funny. Um, I I liked that. I will say mm-hmm. personally, with Indiana Jones, I think the classics were better because they drew more on history. Um, like yeah. yeah, the Ark of the Covenant is actually a lost treasure that we haven't recovered yet. And I don't know if it's going around vaporizing people, but it's still like a cool, yeah, it, it's still like a cool treasure that we've all wondered about. And they went through different, you know, sort of religious traditions where they go through in the first one, they're using this ancient, right. They're searching for this ancient Jewish artifact. And the second one, they go to a Hindu temple and the third one, they actually go and they're looking for the Holy grail of Christianity. Um, now I'm sure there were other, you know, interesting sort of religious piece of, folklore they could have explored rather than kind of going into the i'd say like the cold war aliens right aliens right? we're fighting russians in the nevada well, I, didn't, I i i didn't mind that route honestly like the aliens was a little bit much but i i don't know i guess it was a weird departure for the series like i don't know what made them want to do aliens i i, I still find the film very enjoyable though like I don't know. I, I it was a lot of CG, of course, for its time, but I didn't mind seeing it. I just know that the fifth one, they almost reckoned in these character a lot. Like it's not even like they just make him a joke. Yeah. Did you yeah, just screenshot sorry. something? <laughs> uh oh yeah, sorry. Uh, but the um. Yeah, it's, I think it's just sort of the, with all these problems, it's a lack of originality where they're trying to continue these franchises past their prime. Indiana Jones should have ended at three, Toy Story should have ended at three, um, and, you know, Avengers should have ended at, you know, 
whatever, like three part two. The um, third of, or well, yeah, yeah, that's fourth film, which was like because it's like the third one yeah. was split in two. Yeah, um, and that's my kind of a um, uh, that's my kind of rule for these things. I've a- almost never actually forgiven a franchise for continuing past part four. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's just. It, it ends up creating zombie movies and by zombies, movies, I don't mean movies about zombies, but where they're trying to sort of keep this undead character alive and they have to, like you're talking about them ruining characters. They have to do that because you can't have a character arc without a character who's flawed, except if you've already had a character have their arc, then you have to keep messing them up somehow. Um, which I find is kind of a, yeah, kind of a silly, a silly way of doing it. Um, that being said, We've been going for an hour and 25 minutes as we speak. Yeah, I know. I was just about to conclude the the podcast episode. I, I, I'll, I'll conclude it here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for tuning in to our podcast episode today. And yeah, thank you, Kayla, for having or for coming on to the podcast, Thanks like always. Um, yeah, no worries, man. And yeah, for anybody who hasn't checked out the channel or... But you do have other episodes of podcasts and stuff like that. And I also have my own gaming channel. So, yeah, without further ado, goodbye. Have a good one.